Well, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for coming. It's really nice to see you. Um, we're going to have Yvonne Miller Wallace giving our talk this afternoon. And I want to welcome you on behalf of the Fiber Art Network and our On the Bias exhibition, which is one of, uh, one of several in a long stream of exhibitions. Um, I want to say also thank you to the Ukrainian Arts Council, and particularly to Lizzie, who does all our taping, and to Robin, who helps us with the receptions, and Boris, who does all the bookings, and they've been a really tremendous help in promoting our work and in providing the gallery space. So we just want to say thank you. And Fiber Art Network is a group of emerging or professional artists um, working in the field of fiber arts. And we come from Canada's western provinces and northern territories. We have about 100 members and we're growing still. And we produce two shows a year, one of which is the size and scope of this particular exhibition, and another one that's a smaller boxed exhibition that travels to schools and smaller galleries and is used more for education about the fiber arts. And this one is our sort of uh, thematic show, and it's, a, it's also a traveling exhibition, so it goes across Canada and sometimes to the United States and as far away as New Zealand. So, we'll talk today about the show itself. There are 48 works here by 48 different artists, and you'll see the range of um, techniques and scope and themes. Yvonne will talk more about the themes. Um, but I just wanted to give you the prompts that were given to the artists that they had to respond to. Um, bias can be negative or positive, conscious or subconscious, scientific or philosophical. Bias can be applied to society, to politics, or to the environment. And it can also apply to interactions with family, friends, and neighbors. For textile artists, on the bias has a technical meaning and it becomes a play on words, and you're probably all fiber people, so you know. But Yvonne's going to talk more about that. As humans and artists, we're familiar with the concept of bias as being negative, a prejudice in, in favor or against a thing, a person, a group, and usually in a way that's considered really unfair. But we all have places or people or things that we prefer. And that positive bias is a part of life also. And so you'll see those viewpoints echoed in all the pieces. And Yvonne will tell you more about that. So now, for those of you who might not know Yvonne, I'll tell you a bit about her. I first got to know Yvonne about 2013, I think. And we played together in a surface design group that was made up of members of Fiber Art Network and the Edmonton and District Quilt Guild. Um, we did marbling, felting, painting floor cloths, dyeing ranges of colors with fabric, just about anything that anybody could think of, we tried it. And so as long as I've known Yvonne, she's been an experimenter, she's been eager to learn, she's been very busy, and I think she has more energy than anyone I've ever met. <laughs> so it, it's been fun to grow alongside her and to learn, and to learn from her too. She sent me a bio to talk to you about her journey in fiber and the milestones that have been important. So from an early age, Yvonne believed that art would play a role in her career. But sometimes early experiences push you into a different path than you expected. And in her case, a teacher in high school caused her to totally abandon art in favor of science. So she went on to study meteorology at McGill University and spent 34 years as an Arctic meteorologist, I still have trouble with that word, with Environment Canada. Meteorology may not have been art in a formal sense, but forecasting the weather requires a lot of creative imagining, especially in the north. <laughs> so today you can see the influences, this is my observation, of the northern environment, the northern weather, geography, and the culture in Yvonne's art because of all the time that she spent there. The year 2000 brought her another milestone in her artistic journey. She decided to make a memory quilt for her mom who was experiencing memory loss. And that creative endeavor started her back on the path towards art again, creating imagery with textiles. Experimenting, this is her quote now, experimenting and laughing with the quilt guild surface design group further opened her eyes to possibilities. <laughs> so we both remember it fondly. When she retired in 2013, Yvonne joined the Fiber Art Network. Since then, she's been fully immersed in learning and formally, sorry, formal learning and creating. As a mixed media artist, she enjoys combining a variety of skills to, to create. 
She works with photography and digital design, acrylic and watercolor painting, sketching, stitching, felting, and working with plants to print and dye on paper and textiles. So you see what I mean by lots of energy and busy lady. Um, she works with the plants, the dyes, and the prints in the summer, and she paints, felts, and works into her plant compositions in the winter. And they're all in combination with curling in the winter and biking and golfing in the summer because she doesn't have that to do. <laughs> she just wants to stay active, that's what it is. Nature and the environment are reoccurring themes in her work, and Yvonne has been shown locally, regionally, and internationally in groups and social shows. Thanks, Judy. It has been, you know, especially retirement has been a real opportunity to explore, to grow, and have a next career that maybe you had been destined to start with, you know. So, again, thank you everyone for coming out on this beautiful day. You could have had many other things, I'm sure, but thank you very much. And thank you, the Aqua, for again hosting another fan show. It's a great space to be able to work in. Thank you. Um, what I plan to talk today about is the definition of bias according to the Google. I have to admit that when this topic came out for Within Fan, I didn't actually look at the suggested requirements. I'm the kind of research person, I heard the word bias and then it took me in a deep dive of books, libraries, Google searches and everything like that. I'm a researcher at heart. I guess I am a scientist, right? So what I'm going to talk today about is definition of bias according to Google. Why do we have bias? What does on the bias mean? How do we make a decision? Why is bias important to us? Types of bias, and we'll see all definitions of it in, in the works here. Construction of this piece, this is my piece here. Um, about, about dandelion and dandelion bias, so everything is about bias. And just some concluding remarks, and I have a little show and tell at the end if people want to see some of the things that I've been playing with. So, definition of bias. Now, the origin of the word, word is not known, but it is thought to be derived from the old French word in the 13th century meaning against the grain or sideways, and likely derived from a Latin word meaning office or pharmacy. Now, I just recently at a luncheon that I was at with the meteorologist, and there was a lot of francophones there, they said dandelion means to piss on. <laughs> I don't know if it's a spot of the color left in the bed or the fact that dandelions are a diuretic. I'm not sure. So <laughs> next time you see a dandelion, piss on it. <laughs> Uh, it's found uh, dead. The word bias is a noun, uh, inclination, countable or unaccountable towards something. A verb uh, is to place a bias upon or to influence. An adjective inclined to one side. An adverb, slanting manner, diagonally on the bias. Bias is everywhere. The lawn bowling balls are actually shaped and made to have a bias for their role. You find it in electronics and textiles mortality statistics, and bias is not good or bad, it just is, and you'll find out why. But often by, bias caused by an adverse judgment or negative opinion formed beforehand or without complete knowledge of facts, this we know as prejudice. Ethnicity, religion, gender, sexism, politics, and social class are often the target of prejudice. So, prejudice really is a negative offshoot of bias. Now, I found the term, and this has got nothing to do with this presentation, without prejudice. I'm like, how can you be without, say in the law, they say without prejudice? And it's a phrase that is used in formal legal correspondence or communication to indicate the content of a document is confidential and not to be used by another party in a court or any other way. So can you actually do something that is prejudiced, kill somebody, put it in a document, send it to somebody and say, well, you can't actually use it in a court of law. So why do we have bias? Well, it's pretty simple. It all starts here. Our brains like to categorize objects. 
In our busy sensory world, it helps us to ignore the familiar and investigate the new. Bias is inevitable. We don't have the time to evaluate every thought or every decision. You could be looking at the construction people outside, the new people that walked in, whatever. You have to be able to categorize right now what is important, and that is me, right? <laughs> Our brains also gravitate naturally towards a negativity or a negative bias. We will speed, breakneck speed down a, a beautiful highway, not even notice what we're going by. But there's an accident on the side of the road, what happens? Rubber necking, traffic jams, what happened? Because we, are, we gravitate towards the negative. What is that bad thing that just happened there? This all makes sense that with the information coming in, your brain has to differentiate between the safe and unsafe. It's critical to be able to respond quickly and appropriately to your surroundings. Imagine if you had to keep thinking about everything, you know, there's an there's a uneven piece of sidewalk. Well, am I going to trip or not? Problems some do occur sometimes as how we categorize good versus bad, safe versus unsafe, based on the familiarization and social stigma. Even when we encounter information that suggests you are wrong, we feel more comfortable keeping to our entrenched beliefs. Has everybody been guilty of that? So in other words, bias is simply the brain telling you something that is not really true. It is just a shortcut used to make a thousand decisions a day. You would never get out of the liquor store if you did not employ bias. Chardonnay, Shiraz, white, red. Okay, I'm not even gonna talk about the beer selections. Not that I like beer, so I wouldn't like those. I have a bias to work against beer. So, but I, I have to also say, what does on the bias mean? Because that's what this show is all about, right? Well, if you are involved with textiles, you know the phrase on the bias. Cutting diagonally across the warp and the weft, I can never remember which is one, ensures that the cloth will drape nicely. It also won't fray. It gives a nice stretch around curves. Now, this is a really nice positive bias to have, except if you, as in this gray piece over here, except if you're trying to piece together all these little triangles, you do not want this fabric stretching or you won't be able to get the perfect fits between the pieces. So an example of positive negative bias, it depends on what you're using it for. Now also follow my logic here. I have fun with this one. It might not be right. It was from a logic math course I took a long time ago. So if the warp is the vertical bias and the weft is a horizontal bias, then cutting on the diagonal on the bias implies a neutral bias that is equally based between the vertical and horizontal bias. So by argument, flexibility implies a neutral bias. You might not agree or not, but anyways. I thought that was interesting. So how do we make a decision? A decision naturally begins with a snap judgment. Ooh, nice. You're not sure why nice. And then a post hoc rationalization, or we make a decision, nice, has chocolate, has broccoli. Okay, we'll leave the broccoli quick. That's probably not nice. Everything depends on the information your brain receives and the bias that you apply to it. Maybe you do like broccoli, and that's really what you want to have. You don't want chocolate. Otherwise, of course, our biases change with age. When you're born, you don't know a lot. Well, like we're presuming you don't know a lot. But anyone who's taking care of a baby, tell me that they don't have a lot of biases right from the get-go. Or maybe my kids were unusual. There's a lot of biases. By 19, you think you know everything worth knowing and have some questionable biases, especially when it comes to safety. Think of the young male insurance costs, accidents. But you know what, this is probably a really good thing. Well, maybe in the past it was a really good thing because if, if the folks told you it was time to go get some meat and you gotta hunt down that herd of 
mastodons or mammoths or something like that, you didn't want to be afraid. You wanted somebody that would be fearless to do that, otherwise you'd never get any food. So, so maybe that's an evolutionary thing. I don't know. What do you think? Now, after, after that it's all downhill, you, you know and experience more, which makes you realize how little you do know, or maybe you don't realize how much you don't know because you're biased. Uh, but you change all the time. Just think when you had your kids, how your bias has changed about children. My children, when I have them, will never do this. Yeah, eat your words, baby. So, I don't know, does experience improve your bias detector? I don't know, I'll leave that question up for you. That's hard, that's a hard one to answer. I once came across a quilt judge. I was taking the minutes, or the notes, and everything that had buttons on it won a prize. And I was like, wow, this is judging. A button on it, it gets a prize. That's easy. I can just put buttons on things and I win prizes all over the place. So be care mindful that even the experts and critics have their own biases. So types of bias, just a few. It's only two pages. Actually, I was reading through all the artist statements on here. And a lot of these are talked about in here. So, the well-known one, safety bias. We protect against loss more than we seek gain. We are happier not to lose money, for example, than to, to, to unexpectedly get money. Risk-taking is scary. Now, there's always people on the edges. Similarity bias. We prefer what is similar over what is different. We create in-groups and out-groups. Do you remember junior high? I heard some. <laughs> Expedience bias. We prefer to act quickly rather than take our time. In the same way, we like things closer at hand than further away. A bird of the hand, because we're two in the bush. This one almost burned down my deck. Expedience. I'll get back to that later. Experience bias. We take our perception to be the truth. Problem is people don't see things the same way. Good to have Good to have others give you a reality check and listen. Confirmation or cherry picking bias. A tendency to listen to information that confirms your beliefs. I think we've been seeing a lot of that, especially with social media. So, I don't need to go to college because Bill Gates never graduated from a college or university and look how well he's done. So you cherry picked your example. The ostrich effect. You know that one. Hindsight bias. I always knew that would happen. Have you ever said that one or heard somebody else say that? Planning bias. Oh, this is a terrible one. Oh, underestimating the time it would take to do something. Yeah, anybody have that problem? No. <laughs> I saw that, Cheryl. <laughs> Random error bias. You're always trying to categorize it. You're trying to, out of randomness, you're trying to find something that is meaningful. And that's where superstition comes from. First out of the gate bias. Tendency to overly be influenced by the first piece of information you hear. Makes it difficult to consider others. So you're giving a presentation. If the, the, the first big key punch, that'll be the one that you want people to remember. I was it, oh, was it piss on bail? Oh dear. <laughs> a framing bias. Well, we all know that 80% fat-free yogurt is a lot happier, I uh, have happier, healthier, well maybe it's happier too, healthier than yogurt that has 20% fat in it. We all know that. I hope you all got that one. Yes. <laughs> Anchoring bias, a tendency to be influenced by things that happened after the event. Talk about eyewitness accounts and reliability. Do you ever find that your story kind of readjusts itself a little bit depending on what might happen right afterwards or what other people might be saying? 
A self-serving bias, well, you need that to protect your self-esteem. Immediate gratification bias, oh, chocolate comes into mind. A halo effect, a false consensus. Well, everybody believes that. So they must be right. They must be right. Availability bias and the sunk cause bias. Now, okay, I want to hear, I want to see hands go up for sunk cause bias. Beating a dead horse you've invested in. Whether it's a quilt project that you started, an art project that you started, you know, or that, that recipe, and you think, well, you know, I'll fix that up if I just put a little bit more of this stuff in, you know? But only one hand went up. I am shocked, I am shocked, I am shocked. I, I will not put my hand up. So let's talk about the construction of this piece. It's called Dandelions, not Piss on Bib, Drops of Sunshine, and uh, some hidden bias. And I want you to share a secret about it because you came to my talk. The piece was actually designed to be deceptive. From the topic to the construction, and that is what art is all about. A quick first impression can be deceptive until you look closer and think about it. This, of course, there of course is no right answer since we all have our own biases. Art is truly in the iron of the beholder. So there are some deceptive things in here. I also hoped that it would be an outliner, outlier in the show. Remember our negative bias tendency, I wanted the opposite. I figured that a lot of people would have a negative bias in the show because we gravitate towards negativity, naturally. So I decided I was going to have the happiest piece in the show. It was, how could that not make you smile and be happy? Unless, I guess, unless you have a dandelion bias. So the topic of dandelions is not in the news. It does not highlight injustice. It's not scary. Have you ever had dreams, nightmares about dandelions coming after you? I'd killer tomatoes, I know, but not dandelions. Um, from all appearances, it's just a bright, sunny flower. I'm not even going to call it a weed. Flower. Design, the design is outwardly minimalistic. I usually go all out with some of my pieces, but this I decided I was going to make it very minimalistic. But there are hidden surprises. If you look at it, it's protein fibers from silkworms and the wool of sheep. Most of the other ones, with the exception of one piece on the back wall, are all based with cottons. So, so, but if a vegan looked at this piece, they would likely discard the piece because they use protein fibers from silkworms and wool of sheep. Whereas, uh, and they would feel more comfortable with a cotton bias which the environmentalists might take exception to because there's some issues about environmental use of growing cotton. So everybody has a bias. Now, expedience bias. Sometimes it makes it difficult to notice what is below the surface of an idea because you're in a hurry. You've got all these beautiful 48 quilts to look at. You might notice the lustrous hand-dyed silk that's here. But would you notice the lumps and the simple stitches that are there? They're just ghost impressions of what might lie below the surface or is on the surface. There are also a few perceptions, design perceptions, that occur in this piece. I'm not sure if I'm going to say it right, the Pietro or the 80-20 principle. In this principle, 20% of the population pays for 80% of the taxes. It's something that reoccurs and reoccurs in all different areas of our lives. 20% of customers will buy 80% of your art. 80% of consequences come from 20% of causes. Or in this piece, 20% of the important elements and 80% is just supporting cast. The application is intended to give your brain a place to rest so that you can figure out what's important and want to stay there. Texture, 
Saturation and vibrancy are intended to draw the, the viewers in, and there was a few of these quilts alluded to, to that. I originally planned to make it a grey background or a black background to, to resemble asphalt, or, um, but I just couldn't do it. I wanted the, warm, the warmness of the soil, a kind of a soil texture, because I just can't stand I need color, <laughs> and that's my bias. Besides, I think it looks nicer. <laughs> the diagonal line gives a sense of movement, perhaps instability or danger. It draws the eye into the focal point. Hopefully the energetic diagonal scar gives you a hint of what might lie below the surface, a sense of violence, and encourage you to visit. You need to, you need to come close to this piece to see all the secrets. The other things that are showing up is the bias of odd numbers. Three, you never do four dandelions or two dandelions. For some reason, I don't know what the bias, our brains like odd numbers. The rule of thirds, you hear that in photography, never put the horizon line smack down the middle. Now, you do see beautiful paintings, and, and we have been investigating quite a few in our critique group where they do have the horizon in. So it's a guideline, it's not a law. The left to right reading in the Western culture, where our eye will come in naturally, come in this way and work our way through. Even the one to, one to two ratio of height to, to width imparts a sense of power. Imagine if it was a restful horizontal format, would have fought with the vertical diagonal lines pushing out of the earth. You're encouraged to come up close and touch the scars and wounds and eruptions from below. Even the delicate flower reveals itself to be much stronger than you might think. And yes, it did cause a, cause a fire, so yes, it is a lot tougher than it looks. So, not to break a promise, I will... Oh, I never did tell Greg about this, my husband. <laughs> the dandelions are made out of a thermal fusible felt. And I didn't know what kind of felt, but I did find it and I had a toaster oven, and I was doing it outside to be safe. Okay, she's already out of cake, she already can see what's happening here. <laughs> because you didn't want the fumes in your house, you didn't want the fumes in your oven where you're cooking your food, and I was being safe. I, I, I have a safety gene here, you know, don't think I'm being reckless. And I made a whole bunch of the, the, the leaves and, and the flowers, and, um, and then I wanted to, a little later I wanted to make one more. Have you ever done that? Just, just, a, just, a, just get that one more. Just kind of. So the expedience bias. I figured preheating. What really is that for? I'm just going to put it in all at the same time. Well, a few minutes later, there were balls of flames coming out of the toaster oven. I ripped out the racks onto the deck, and I was looking at it going. Well, this could be another problem I have to solve. I actually thought that. But I was lucky because acetate, it burns really quickly down to a powder. And it didn't, Greg never even knew. He never saw the mark on the deck. It was fun. So this is how expedience bias can cause you some problems. So just remember that next time when you're thinking, well, why do I really need to do it that way? Okay, so why did I choose the dandelion? Well, as I alluded to, the secret is it's really not on like dandelions, but on the other hand, maybe it is about, both about the dandelion, the sunny flower, and, and the absurdity, absurdity of, of construed dandelion bias. Dandelions are the poster child for what I call dandelion bison. You've got to all remember this next time, you know. So, let's talk about the dandelion. Derived from the Latin word meaning officer ph pharmacy or piss on bed. It's one of the first flowers we see in the spring. Aren't we so happy when we see those, those, those fields of yellow happy flowers up there? Finally, dandelion was this, once known as the boon to a garden. European gardeners would weed out the grass to allow the dandelions to grow. Who would have thought? <laughs> they were cultivated in ancient Egypt, Rome, Greece, and Japan. 
They're all over the world. They were brought to the New World by the Puritan pilgrims on their ships. And, and, and those ships, did you see how big they are? How, how tiny they were? They, they wouldn't have just brought, oh, let's just bring dandelions with us. There was a use, there was a reason that they wanted the dandelions. I'm wondering if, if dandelions have even made it to the space station. Somebody could research that and let me know. I, I, I wouldn't be surprised. Medicinally, oh, here's the list. Medicinally, they reduce blood pressure, a diuretic, getting back to what I was told the, the word for dandelion mm -hmm. was in French. Reduces insulin sensitivity, has antibacterial properties, and is an eye vitamin. Dandelions fight toxins, and all parts can be used. Sometimes they have plants where you know you die if you use one part, and, or you get a rash if you use one part. Dandelions, you can't go wrong. In nature, they provide the nectar to 100 different insects, 30 species of birds, chipmunks, I don't know how chipmunks came into this, and bees needed to raise their young, and we all know how important bees are to us. It makes our lawn, a lawn strong, it makes our lawn stronger, did you hear that word, stronger? By loosening the soil and bringing in minerals and fertilize the soil. Their presence is a sign your lawn is not healthy, not that the dandelions make your lawn unhealthy. Dandelion roots in the store are more expensive than lobster. Great tea, I've been drinking it since I was a little girl. Food, I and mean, I've never tried the wine, but I've heard it's good. Sources of vitamins and minerals, A, C, K, E, iron, calcium, magnesium, potassium, antioxidants, good thing I don't have any more fingers. Dandelions are just plain old fun. You can't get into trouble for picking them. Your neighbor's not going to get mad if you go on their land and pick, lawn and pick their dandelions, right? They are muse to art, music, and poems. Plus, they are great decorations in your hair and gifts for parents. Have you not all picked dandelions for your parents? And boy, are they ex they're successful. They go way, way, way down in the earth. And they have a lifespan of 15 to 25 years. That dandelion in your lawn, it's going to probably outlive a lot of us. It can withstand drought and grow in the most inhospitable places. So why are they hated so much? Why are they the target of sharpened tools, weapons, and chemical warfare? Why do we look the other way on a practice that kills 7 million wild birds annually? I don't know where they come up with the numbers, but 7 million wild birds sounds like a big number to me. Never mind the extensive damage to the soil's inhabitants. So, why? Where'd this bias come from? Is there some guilt here in this group? Here? Yeah. So here's why. Sometime in the early 20th century, a fashion trend decided that lawns had to be composed of bl blades of grass that, frankly, were never really meant to grow there. And uh, this practice, you know, you're, you're high class if you have the best lawn. You are the most meticulous person, the best person if you have a perfect lawn. So this practice has created what I call a, a genetic fear bias. What will the neighbors think if we stray from the fashion trend? Can we risk being in the out group? Ooh, look at that person. It's the house down the street with all the dandelions. It's always been this way. This is what lawns are. We've always had lawns in our house. So it can't be wrong. Lawns are necessary and they need to look this way. It's a story of false consensus. Experience bias, maybe at work. Okay, I didn't have all the points on that. Just, just in case you were worried, you could be there. <laughs> so, why did I choose the diety line as a subject of my interest? I've kind of explained a little bit already. I wanted to pick a subject that was unexpected, non threatening, not a source of discord or hateful. I wanted to find an object, so the only flaw is that after potholes, keeps the 311 city compliance lines busy in the spring. <laughs> so ask yourself now, how can something so useful be the target of so much bias? How can we recognize when our bias is irrational? 
What are negative biases we blindly accept today? What are some biases that will become examples of prejudice 30 years from now in a textile show? How many of you have blown on a puffball to make a wish? Because that's the other thing that dandelions can do. They can grant wishes. Maybe we could blow on a puffball and we could wish for better, wiser use of our bodies. So I, I would like to invite you all to read the artist statements and find the different types of bias that the artists are talking about. See what some of the society biases that are being reflected in here. There is a whole range of them. So, but first of all, when you go up to them, look at it. Think what it says to you. Do you like it? Do you not like it? Are you neutral about it? What do you think it says? And come up with your story about what it is. And then read the artist statement and see. Because art is all, all in the art of the beholder. It's, it's not just what the artist says. It's, it's your art. It's, it's, your, it's your ability to look at and decide for yourself. I also brought a few things with me that I've been working on. Different types of, I wanted to show examples of different types of felting. This is Nuno felting, but I have other types of felting here. I also have some of my eco prints and how I've used it on paper and how I've used paper in felting and eco printing. Um, I brought the piece that accidentally blew into the pot of ferrous sulfate and I thought it got destroyed, but it's one of my favorite pieces now. Even though my color bias is offended by the fact that there's not a lot of color on it now. It's, so, as I alluded, there are different types of felting. This is felting that incorporates a layer of silk and wool fiber is encouraged to blend through the weave of the silk so it's all attached so it is like one, one textile. So that's called Nuno felting. You can have degrees of felting. Oh, I'll show you. That is silk. This is actually paper that has been felted into wool. And then it was eco-printed, and this is the one that flew in the air because it was eco-printed outside. Flew in the air and went into ferrous sulfate and made it all gray. <laughs> but I really like it. I keep thinking, I gotta, I gotta put some color in it, but I just can't, I can't do it. So I think it's just gonna live as, as is. I mean, and it's all my favorite weeds. There's fireweed, well, then there's peonies, and there's um, uh, goldenrod. I mean, my backyard loves weeds. <laughs> my neighbors do not. Okay, so that's paper, that's silk felted into wool, or wool felted into silk. This is wool felted into paper. Um, this piece is silk felted into wool, papers, different papers felted into wools, and then inked and stitched and a whole bunch of stuff going on in there. Then there's degrees of felting. This is felting. Judy made one of these too. I mean, you could knock yourself out with one of these things. It's like stone. And I mean, I, I guess I could have felt it even more. And it's, it's very hard. It's very robust. They make slippers out of it. They probably made tents out of it, stuff like that. But then, I love taking courses with Moy McKay. And she does a lot of landscape. And botanicals and if you touch this it is barely fold it is barely felted and is not really fold so you go from one gamut to to make a house out of this stuff construction material to this is barely holding together so I like doing nature of course so canola fields how can you not love canola fields my happy flowers like abstracted happy tulips. You, what's nice about felt is that you can, it's like having paints. You can blend the colors, you can mix the colors. It's tougher than when you're mixing watercolor acrylic paints because the color beneath that really does influence the color that's on top, which is probably true for watercolor too. 
But um, so it's it's a real, I guess I should hold it the right direction. Um, so it's a real challenge, and then to to when once you've introduced rubbing and water and soap to keep the objects in the place that you had intended it to be. But then you can always go in and do dry needle felting, which is another thing, is you get these really sharp needles that I usually prick my fingers with and I bleed all over my work. And you just take fiber and you, and you needle it in. And then you can put accents in. So this is wet felting, dry felting, hand stitching, machine stitching, all on one piece of artwork. This was based on, Greg and I had our 40th wedding anniversary a couple summers ago. Of course, the COVID, we couldn't go anywhere, so we went to Jasper in the summertime. But then I wanted to do a winter scene, and I love the picture, so I had to make it winter. So I'm just Jasper dreaming. And again, this is wet felted, needle felted, hand stitched, machine stitched, and then just mounted on a, on a frame. I love to work, as Judy said, in the summer with plants. So, on fabric, an apron, mm -hmm. on paper felt with an accident, my very favorite fireweed. I love fireweed. Greg, I think he has. He's, he's very accepting. He hasn't said any, well, he's alluded to the growth of my fireweed. <laughs> I just, I and you can use it as part of a mixed media. Oh, more fireweed, <laughs> who would have thought? <laughs> um, peonies. And you can do other mixed media techniques on it. I also like working with natural ingredients, plants, and you can get a whole swath of colors from them. And, and then you use modifiers like copper sulfate to change the value of them. So anywhere from weld to buckweed, buck, buckthorn, uh, I've got madder, kutch, lac. Does anyone know what lac is? Everyone heard the word shellac? Mm -hmm. Well, shellac is the stuff you put on the, on, on the furniture. Well, it comes from the lac bug. It goes in and makes the shellac around it. So that this is the bug, it's the lac bug. It makes a beautiful purple. Eastern Brazil wood, Coach, cochineal. Anyone know what cochineal is? <laughs> Okay. Oh yeah, it's a bug that grows on a cactus, type of cactus. And I have to, you know, Greg had a real problem with me wanting to use his coffee grinder to, to grind them up. <laughs> I don't know what his problem is. <laughs> There's logwood. Uh, so these are all different combinations. And then, and then you can kind of water them down to make change the values of them and you can these were some of these were mixed together or some of these could be overlaid with each other so there's it's just like having a regular color palette the only color that really is kind of missing is the blues and of course you say well it's indigo which is a beautiful blue but it's a it's a different process to to use uh, it, it it uses the process of oxidation to get the blue and these don't involve that kind of process. And then here, especially for you, Judy, this that flew into the ferrous. I've fallen in love with ferrous sulfate. Mm -hmm. So this is thick and ferrous sulfate, which is like an iron. And you can print with it. You can do all sorts of things. And also, you don't need plants. Well, plants contain tannins, and tannins, so these are all tannin colors. So you can use plant dye, you can use tannins, you can use metals, you can use all sorts of stuff just out there to do your textile work. You don't have to buy, well, I do buy my stuff from Mayoa, but you don't have to buy chemical dyes to dye your fabrics. And that's it. Thank you for coming. Now, any 
any questions? No. I just didn't realise you could actually get them vibrant colours just from natural flowers. Because whenever I've looked at somebody dying of flowers or plants, it's always so... Muted? Yeah. It's the process that you put it through. You really have to... I often use a, a tannin base, and then I'll use a specific mordant. And then you have to, to base the amount of stuff, plant stuff or whatever, based on the weight of the fabric. So if I was not buying the Mewa's extracts or already ground or processed stuff, you would need for 400% plant matter dandelions, how many, to, for every gram of fabric. So you need, you need a lot of natural, like just from the backyard stuff. So I think a lot of people, when they're using it, they, they haven't used enough. And I also will go through a uh, process of chalking. Uh, it's called, it used to be called dunging, because they use poop <laughs> to, to set the colors and enhance the colors. So there's pre and post processing. So it's not just necessarily a matter of, you can. I, we started out, rem oh, remember, oh, we were the three witches, of, the four witches of Macbeth in my backyard. <laughs> oh, I have to tell this story. I bought this book in India Flint, and she, what she did was she had mason jars, and, and it was like canned peaches. You stuff fabric in, you stuff plants in, and you stuff metal, because metal is, needs, is part of the process of the dye being able to adhere to, to the fabric. Otherwise, it, you know, would you believe that blueberries are not a good dye? Anyways, so we decided as our, our group, we were in the backyard. Oh, we had a we had a big cauldron. We had our fire pit going. It was before I used the barbecue because it wasn't hot enough. And we had tables out with all the eyes of Newt and <laughs> on the table, this guy looks over the fence and he had a stricken look on his face. <laughs> and I thought. He's seen the three, the witches of Macbeth and I call them. <laughs> so, remember that day? That was interesting. I think we had marigolds and goldenrod and um, a, a number of other weeds that we were putting into it. Yeah. yeah. And it came out with some uh, some lovely results, but they were actually quite quite muted compared to to doing this. So there is a huge learning curve, uh, chemistry of treating the different plants slightly different and, and starting and ending and how you apply the mordants before, after, thicken, not thicken. It's, it's a huge chemistry class in my studio right now. Hmm. So do you find using plants to be better than using like vegetables or fruits? Um, a lot of the berries won't, are not color fast. So you might get color on your clothing and you think, oh, I'm never going to get that blueberry stain out like forever and ever and ever and ever. But it won't stay, it's not color fast. So certain plants, would, the plants that do well have, have a high tannin content. So if it doesn't have a tannin content in it, it's harder to to process and to keep the color of the cloth because you you don't want after a year to you, your beautiful masterpiece to have well, lost it. Look color. like that one there. I'll just throw in some fair sulfate. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so not all plants are created equally, and it it's, if you want to do it well, you need to 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 deep to a deep dive. There's some excellent excellent books out there that look at the chemistry of the different plants and how much you need by weight, and, and how you should process it. So, yes, it's another rabbit hole to go down. <laughs>